and then Dean, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's Q&A around our HR related topics. Um, do a little bit of level setting and then we'll get to a quick um, uh, presentation on some of the fastest changing HR topics out there. And then we'll definitely get to this Q&A. So definitely just want to introduce who we are as Arminino. Um, our goal is to be the most innovative and entrepreneurial firm that is making a positive impact on the lives of our clients, people, and communities. And that's why we do things just like this. Um, our Q&As have been wildly successful and uh, definitely encourage you guys to uh, please send in your questions. Um, we are a holistic full service firm and definitely have the traditional tax and audit capabilities. The CARES package has lots of tax benefits out there that all organizations should be looking at. Um, other ways that we're helping organizations today include uh, business outsourcing, CFO advisory, technology consulting, um, SOX, SOP, cybersecurity and privacy, communication, strategy and transformation, restructuring, and artificial intelligence. Um, have numerous awards down there that we're really proud of, but the ones that we're most proud of is the one that gives us the best of accounting client satisfaction survey five years in a row and best firms. Um, to work for and best firms uh, for technology. So with that said, next slide, Megan. So yeah, so HR considering uh, considerations and let's, let's get to it. I mean, there's a lot of fast changing roles and our presenters today, Jen and Shannon, please take it. Oh, and what do you that, want? I'll, I'll just kind of go through our considerations of what we're gonna cover today. And um, it is the FFCRA review. Th there's going to be a whole lot of acronyms in here, right, ladies? Uh, but we'll work our way through it. FFCRA eligibility and calculations and uh, more uh, frequently asked questions around furloughs. Next slide. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon Oswald. I'm the director of the HR outsourcing group at Armanino. Uh, consulting division. Today we're going to be talking about HR considerations under the COVID-19 health crisis, specifically around employer options and uh, some of the things available for both employers and employees. Um, first of all, a general overview. Some of the first legislation that was passed in response to the coronavirus pandemic was the FFCRA, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. You might also hear it referred to as HR 6201. They're both the same thing. Um, so the FFCRA went into effect on April 1st, 2020. And there's basically two main components to it. It talks about, well, first off, it talks about other things as well, such as um, you know, nutrition requirements for school-aged children, and there's some other things there. As far as the employer-employee component, we're really looking at the Emergency Family Medical and Leave Act leaves, and also emergency paid sick leave. Um, these plans are both reimbursable by the U.S. government. This is a federal legislation, and it talks about paid leaves that employers will be required to pay their employees in some circumstances. Basically addresses sick leave and leave for childcare uh, for a response to school closures and daycare closures and things of that ilk. Go ahead to the next slide. Hang on right. one sec, Shannon, I just wanna stop. I just, I, um, so just to be clear, this starts on April 1st. So if people had folks out in March, they do not apply, correct? Right, the, uh, the, focus of this starts on April 1st. So if you had people on leave prior to that, um, they would not be eligible for the sick portion of this leave. Um, and if you had people who were furloughed or laid off, they would not be eligible for it. So you need to be very careful when you look at the date range for what you're um, working with. Okay, 
and you said that it's 100% paid for by the federal government. This is a federal plan. So the feds are the people that will reimburse the employers if they have these leaves, correct? Right, right. And to be clear about that, it is federally reimbursed, but the initial payments do come from the employer. So um, if you have employees that are eligible for this leave, you need to pay them per the guidelines of the leave, and then you apply for that reimbursement from the government. Got it. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Jen, do you wanna take this one to talk about eligibility and qualifications? Sure. Uh, I am Jen McCabe and I'm a partner here in the Business Outsourcing Services Group at Armanino where we do all kinds of things. This is one of them that's very important. Um, the FFCRA applies to employers that have less than 500 employees. And this is interesting because it dovetails with the FMLA, which has a different headcount rule. So there are exemptions for people who have less than 50 employees if complying with this regulation is just too difficult and too costly. Um, what's interesting about that is that it would mean that they just don't have the staff to support uh, the payroll, really, or the administravia that goes along with this, even though the leave is 100% reimbursed by the government. It also applies to an employee who has been employed for at least 30 days. So if you hired someone in January, and they're still with you, even if part-time, they are eligible for a paid FFCRA leave. And what's really interesting about this is when the law came out, a lot of people said, hey, now that we have to shelter in place, does that qualify as a paid leave under the first part of this act, of this regulation really, it says if you're out and you can't work because you're in a quarantine situation, then that qualifies for a sick leave. But the DOL later came out and um, confirmed that that's not the intent of the legislation. Somebody actually has to be closer to sick, basically. You can't just be having to hang out at your house and qualify for this paid sick leave. And we'll discuss the nuances of the difference later so that you all understand exactly who qualifies to be paid under this leave. That's right. And then as far as eligibility, I did want to point out the FFCRA essentially has two different types of leave. One is a family medical leave uh, extension and the other is paid sick, which is shorter. It's only two weeks. For the paid sick, there is no 30-day threshold for employment. Everyone is eligible for that from day one, but that's the shorter sick leave time as opposed to the longer FMLA time. Okay, Hi. moving on. So the certification requirements as I said, there are two different types of leaves under the FFCRA. Um, one of them is called the emergency family medical leave. And that is for someone specifically who has a childcare issue. That's the only way to qualify for the 12 week leave under this plan. The first two weeks are unpaid and the additional 10 weeks are paid for the employee at two thirds rate of their regular pay. And we'll talk about that a little bit further, how you quantify that. I will say that um, the certification for that, there are some requirements that an employee has to provide. If there is another person who can take care of their child who's at home because of school closure or daycare closure, um, you know, that other person should probably be watching the child, which doesn't preclude the employee from working. Um, if there really is no one and they need to watch their child and they're unable to telecommute, then they do qualify for the leave. Um, and in doing that, you should uh, actually, I, well, I would say our recommendation is to develop some kind of documentation or form that you can give to employees that are requesting this FFCRA leave. In there, the employee's name, the dates for which the leave is requested, what the reason is, 
and then include a statement from the employee that they're unable to work and why. Um, you really want to be clear on that to make sure that they're eligible because then you want to be able as the employer to turn around and get reimbursed for those wages. So you wanna make sure before someone takes the leave that they're really eligible for it under the guidelines. Hey, Shan. Mm -hmm. um, the big question on this a lot of times right now, there are tons of people with their kids at home interrupting their Zoom meetings, interrupting them while they're trying to work. And some of them are asking if they have employees at home working and they are interrupted by the fact that they also have to take care of their children or homeschool them right now. They wanna know if this leave applies in that situation. Mm -hmm. It depends, at, at that point, it's a little bit of a subjective between the employee and employer. Um, we all know that these are unprecedented times. And as you said, Jen, a lot of people are working from home. People are using you know, video chat and working remotely when maybe they never have before. Um, I would say from our own experience, you know, there are people whose children might run past them in the background or you might hear a dog barking, um, which you know, in some days that would have been, been unacceptable. I think a lot of people are having a lot more leniency with that type of thing because we know we're all kind of in the same boat. However, if it really reaches the point where, you know, someone might have a toddler and just say, look, I, I, I literally cannot focus on my work and keep my child safe um, as they toddle around the house because there's no one else here to watch them. So that's really the threshold that we're looking for is, you know, I, I can't do my work. I can't telecommute because it's really a full-time job to watch this child and there's no one else to do it. And I, I believe that you're going to tell me that you can't pay someone for a leave if they are able to work. There are that, two separate kinds of pay. You can't be on a leave and also be part-time working. It's one or the other. That's correct. So if someone needs to take a few hours off at a time, but then they come back to work, they're really not on a leave. They can take it in a somewhat intermittent fashion, but you really need to focus on um, the guidelines there and make sure whatever you're doing is compliant. Um, also, if they have a child, in addition to the other certification information you're asking for, they, um, they should really give information about the name of the child, the name of the school or the daycare that's closed. And again, that statement that um, there's no one else to watch the child and the person's unable to work. Right, and as an employer, I'll do the accounting thing right now. If you're submitting for reimbursement from the government, you do wanna have documentation that you did the right diligence here because if it turns out later, and, and this is what's happening out there, that you just took advantage of this paid leave so that you didn't have to pay them a salary over a time or you thought that it was a great boondoggle, you'll be on the hook for perpetration of fraud Whereas if you get something signed by your employee, you're proving that it was a real deal and that you weren't screwing around at all. And you wanna make sure that you're using the leave for the right purpose. So if you have this form, it does a couple things. It protects you. And it also shows that you're asking the right questions and paying a leave for the right reasons in the right circumstances. And because this is all so ambiguous, we really do recommend that you document it or have a little short checklist. It's not a big deal so that you know that you're doing the right things and in case anybody asks about it. And someday we do believe people will ask about it. Right now they're in a panic just to send money out. So prepare yourself. Right, and to that end, any additional documentation you have, like if you get sent an announcement from the school, um, I know a lot of people receive those being on an email distribution list or even get a letter in the mail, I would save a copy of it along with your other documentation. You can request that from the employee. Um, and you know, staple that to it or however you want to store it and keep that information with your documentation. So that's the, the longer 12 week EFMLA leave. And again, it's important to remember the only way to qualify that is for that is the childcare issue. There is another two week leave that is paid. And this is the one that does not have the 30 day working threshold. Everyone's eligible for it immediately. It is also paid at two thirds the regular wages up to a cap, which we'll talk about in a later slide. And this is a little bit broader. This is someone who's really dealing with the issue of illness. So either the employee is ill themselves with COVID-19, they have a family member or a child who is ill, 
or again, they have this childcare issue and they need to take the leave for that. So for that, they can get up to 80 hours of paid leave. And for that, for documentation, I would say, in, you know, on, in, in addition, create a form and collect the same information as we talked about before, the employee's name, why they're asking for the leave, um, what the estimated time frame for the leave is. And then if they, um, if they are ill, if you have any kind of a doctor's note, that you want to put in there, I would say at least give the name of the healthcare provider for which the person's under care. You need to be careful when you're asking for medical information specifically about someone being sick. Keep in mind their HIPAA rights as well because we don't want to throw out any other existing guidelines that we have. So even though everyone's concerned about COVID-19, keep in mind you have to be cautious about asking about someone's personal medical condition. Um, Jen, I know that you were working on that a little bit yesterday. Um, do you have comments on that? Yeah. So the sick leave is paid at different rates. It's 80 hours always, but it's paid differently if the employee is sick versus if a family member of theirs is sick. So if they have a, you need a form that says who's sick because it's a different rate of pay if it's them or a person in their family, that's part one. Part two is you have to actually have some sort of evidence that it's a COVID related sickness. They can't have broken their leg walking in the park or tripping over the stove because they're at home. It has to be a COVID related illness. So you do need a medical qualifier of some sort. That said, we saw some people, some folks asking us, well, what about this form? It looks great, right? And they were asking questions like, what are your symptoms? They were trying to ascertain via the symptom checklist that it was indeed a COVID-related illness and they were trying to comply. But in doing so, they were asking invasive questions. They were asking, what's your temperature? Do you have a runny nose? And you do not want to ask that. That is private information. And it made me very nervous when I saw the form. I started typing as fast as I could for them to stop. So it's a, a very gray area. You need to get medical certification, but you can't ask medical questions. So be very careful. I would, I would recommend keeping the, short, the form that you ask them to fill out very short so you can't make a mistake. Yes, and in some cases we've also found in our research, in order to be eligible for this type of leave, people do not have to have a positive COVID-19 test. That's not a requirement. However, they do need to show that they're under care and that they are potentially being tested for COVID-19. Or that they're in quarantine because they are uh, maybe infected, they were in contact with someone, so they're getting tested. And that's the quarantine wording that gets everybody confused. They might right. not even be sick, but they're under doctor's orders to self-quarantine because they touched the wrong doorknob. Right. Right, so there is that quarantine or isolation order. And if they have that, they really should keep the name of the medical professional that advised them to be on that quarantine or isolation um, or you know, keep that documentation along with it. So I think that addresses the certification yeah. requirements enough. Um, we can, I think, move on to the next slide. Okay, calculating leave, this is, this is the slide we've been referencing for a couple of minutes now, talking about the money that actually the employees can get paid, what the caps are, etc. cetera. Um, so they, um, employees that are eligible for either the EFMLA leave or the paid sick leave get paid at two thirds their wages. And the cap, as Jen said, is different for whether or not they're caring for someone who's sick or caring for a child or whether they are sick themselves. And you can see those caps here, um, 511 per day is the maximum or 5,110 total um, if the employee is ill, subject to quarantine, et cetera. Um, if the cap is for the childcare or caring for others, it's $200 a day or $2,000 total for the sick leave. But then on top of that, this is always the question. People say, what about the family care? So 
if you are both sick and you also have a family person that you have to take care of, um, the family care is usually about children, of course, but then you also might have yourself sick or someone in your family sick. And so when you hear people talking about a maximum of 12 weeks of paid leave, they're actually combining the both leaves because as Shannon said earlier, there's a 12 week family care leave, but two weeks are unpaid. So that's 10 really of paid family leave. And then there's two weeks of paid sick time leave. And if you mush it all together and one of your employees needs everything that we've been talking about, the cap and the out of pocket is $12,000. And that's assuming that they hit the caps on these earnings. You start saying, okay, what's two thirds of this person's pay? And if two thirds of their pay is less than 511 days when they're sick, you pay the lesser amount. So there's a little bit of complexity in calculating this and you know, we can obviously help you or often a payroll provider should have an expert on FFCRA by now on their roster. But you can see that this slide is as boiled down as Shannon could make it and it's still going to confuse people. We studied it for at least a day straight when this act first was published. <laughs> Yes, we had a lot of good, uh, good conversation over this mm -hmm. particular slide. Yes. I would right. agree with you. It, it, we are right. finding it is not as straightforward to calculate. Perhaps there can easily be questions. Um, so I, I have to ask your questions too. You can call Armanino or if you have another source, that's fine as well, but just make sure you understand it before you um, start paying out. Yep. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Um, now that you know that there's a little bit of math to do, we recommend, of course, that you keep great time records because that 80 hours or two weeks of sick time, you need to use records if you have a part time worker of their average work week. That's what you're going to pay them. You're not going to pay someone who works 20 hours a week suddenly 40 hours when they're out sick. So there's a little bit of complexity there. You need time records, you need time sheets. So I hate to say that, I hate time sheets, but you do need time records. You need to have a really good payroll process because in order for you to get the money back from the government, you have to show them what you paid. And what's really cool about this is if you have a larger roster, so say that you have 10 employees or 100 employees, and you pay 99 of the 100 as you would normally, and one person is using a leave, you actually can deduct the amount for this paid leave from your payroll liability and never actually come out of pocket. So this is really important. This is why this was written this way. It's to help people pay for these leaves, give them immediately and not be bummed out. So if you did pay it, you would get the money reimbursed against your next payroll run if you have payroll overall liabilities that outweigh the cost of your leave, you can just deduct the leave and your payroll provider can help you do this. What they do is they tag earnings. So if you work with one of the bigger ones, payroll, paychecks uh, by ADP, Sure Payroll, any of those, they ask you to set up an earnings code for this kind of pay. And you go in and as long as you put it under that code, they will help you track and administer it, and they won't take it out of your deposit to the government. They'll actually give you an instant cash relief if you have enough other payroll to outweigh the credit. So you get 100% reimbursement for the leave pay. The issue here is that you also get 100% reimbursement for the health insurance for the two week leave. So if you're doing you know, rough justice here, if you pay for my health and pre premiums and you pay $200 for me in a month, half a month is $100. That $100 needs to be reported to your payroll processor because they can take that and make sure they take that credit too against your other payroll taxes, okay? The other thing is the payroll processor will get you reimbursed for the payroll tax on the leave pay. It's not just the 500 bucks a day, it's also the 6.2% that employers usually pay on top for social security. So 
you have a couple ways to get that money processed, but if you're tracking it, you can either deduct it in the middle of doing payroll and never really go out of pocket, or you can claim the credit later on a Form 941, which those of you who are accountants, probably most of you haven't actually done one, but you've seen them. And if you're not an accounting professional, there is this quarterly tax form called the 941, and it reconciles the taxes that you owe against the taxes that you paid, and you pay the difference or get a refund. So that's how it works. Be sure you keep good records. And what I'm looking at on this slide is the perfect collision, there's a lot of these, of HR, payroll, and accounting. So if you separate your HR function from your payroll and accounting function, you need to figure out a way to have these things in one room, in one process. In small organizations, it's easier. In large organizations, often you have your HR team separate from your finance and accounting team. And when that happens, these things are not done as correctly as on time or as well quite often. So keep that in mind. You need your HR and payroll people to be besties. Okay, keep going. Yep, that's great. And to reiterate, the earnings codes for this kind of thing, work with your payroll processor. Think about having a code for taking the EFMLA leave. Think of having a code for someone being ill themselves, someone being taking care of a family member, um, and keep the, you know, keep those earnings codes in your time tracking system or some reportable function that you can get that information back because we do yeah. estimate that you're going to need it. Shannon, there's other things going on in the world still like maternity leaves mm -hmm. or a long-term disability leave or a short-term disability leave because someone is sick or maybe someone had a ski accident over Christmas and they were on short-term disability. And you bring up a really good point. In the payroll system, you have to have all of these things tracked differently. And um, Shannon, how would you talk about people on this call who have more than 50 employees but less than 500, maybe are already complying by FMLA. So how do they coordinate FMLA with EFMLA under the FFCRA Act? So I would track the time separately for employers that are already incumbent to comply with the FMLA before any of this additional COVID-19 legislation those rules are still in effect. So if you have people on a, you know, that have just had a child, they can take a bonding leave. If you have someone on a short-term disability, that, you know, there's those job protections still stay in place. The difference is that's an unpaid leave and the EFMLA COVID-19 leaves are paid. And so, you know, that's a big distinction for a yeah. lot of people. Yes, I've been on many calls with clients who say, hey, I'm, I'm ignoring that because I'm already subject to FMLA. And that was a rule that was put in for people who aren't taking care of leaves and protecting jobs. And I have said many times, no, that's different. This is a paid leave. And then their next question is, it's paid? Do I have to pay for it? And then I have to say, no, you're gonna get reimbursed for it, but you have to track it very specially. So the key here, honestly, is working on payroll, tracking these leaves separate from all other kinds of absences, any other kind of sick time or vacation time or leave time. You have to track FFCRA leaves completely separately and you will be 100% reimbursed. Right. But you have to pay it. And I think the worst thing that could happen to an employer is that their employee finds out they should have been paid and that they were not because their small employer just didn't understand the rules. Yes, definitely. You know, it's very much, you can liken it to, you know, having someone say, well, I'll, I'll pay you back for what you spend on my behalf. And then you say, okay, well, um, you know, I'm gonna do all this stuff, but if you don't keep good records, then the person says, okay, what do I owe you? Um, you're like, oh, well, I, you know, I put it all in my bucket. I'm not really sure, I can't separate it. You're probably gonna get shorted on stuff or you're going to have a hard time justifying your expenditures to the government for reimbursement. So super important to keep clear records. I have another question that I get all the time, Shannon. So what mm -hmm. if an employer says, well, that's not as much money, $511 a day or $200 a day is not what my employee makes. I want to have them take the leave and I want to make up the difference. What do you say to that? 
Well, if they're being paid by you, the in, you know it's it's going to be perceived that they're still working. So I would say no. If they're on leave, they should get the leave money, and if they're working, they should get paid for working, even if that's at reduced hours. So I think that there's a lot of confusion that could be brought into the calculation if you try and do some kind of true up in that fashion. Right. So my answer is a very accounting answer. When the uh, state government and the federal government see the employee roster and the people who are on payroll and they compare it to the people who got unemployment or state disability, or in this case, FFCRA leaves, they can immediately get a flag go up and they wanna know that the days that were paid for disability, unemployment, or any sort of paid government leave do not coincide at all with the days that a person is on payroll. And it's very easy for them to come back and do an audit. Most people listening have seen a, an unemployment audit where they come back to you and they say, Jen asked for unemployment, please confirm the days that she was on payroll in this period. And what they're doing is comparing payroll records to leave or disability or unemployment records to ensure that there has been no double dipping by either the employee or the employer. So the, the tracking of time is critically important. It's also going to come into play nowadays if people are unemployed and filing for unemployment. So all of it seems ridiculous, but timesheets are the most important tool for any employer to have, even if you don't want them to track every hour because they're exempt employees and they're on salary, you really need to have this kind of time tracked to protect yourself. And when you go in front of the state or federal folks, when you have any sort of payroll hearing or a wage and hour hearing, the one thing that will save your bacon every time is having timesheets and the auditors will look through it. So someday I hope people listening will remember I said that to them. Great. Okay, moving on to the next slide. All right, so this slide we put in here, this is not specific to the FFCRA. Um, as a matter of fact, the second bullet point, the employer retention credits um, is different from that. However, we wanted to bring this into the conversation as an HR consideration. First off, I wanna give a definition of a furlough. A furlough is really like an unpaid leave of absence based on either financial constraint or lack of work. Um, you're sending someone home, you're taking them off active payroll, but you're intending to bring them back to work when there is an upturn. So there should be a defined kind of short-term period of time, and you should give them a letter that says, this is a, you know, you're being furloughed, here's your estimated return to work date. Although I would be clear on there that it is an estimate, and you know, you're doing this because of some you know, unanticipated situation, and there there may be more unanticipated factors that are happening, but you're estimating a return to work. And employers can do this to enact cost savings, because obviously you're taking them off active payroll without terminating them. So, you know, you're, you're essentially saying you're still my employee, you're just not actively working right now, but I'm going to bring you back. I'm not terminating our relationship. If they're furloughed, they can go apply for unemployment. Um, if they're furloughed, they should not be eligible for one of these paid leaves because they are not on active payroll and they can go and get unemployment. So it's kind of an either or situation. Either they're working, they can work, but for some reason they can't, like the childcare, the quarantine, the sick family member, or they're sick then they can go on a leave and come back when that situation eases. Or if they are actually not working based on being notified that they're furloughed, they can go get an employment, the same as if they had been laid off or terminated. Um, furloughs are considered to be somewhat good for employee retention or at least better than terminating people because then you're ending your relationship. A furlough allows you to keep your relationship somewhat Although, you know, there are some issues to consider with furloughs. If someone's not working for you, they could go look for a job somewhere else. There's nothing to preclude them from doing that. 
the current state of the situation with a lot of um, you know, the unemployment rate going up so much due to the COVID-19 crisis that seems a little more challenging than on a normal day to go out and find a different job, but they could. Um, and then the last piece, I'm going to turn this over to Jen, actually, to talk about the relationship between furloughs and the, um, the payroll protection plan, which is actually under the CARES Act. Okay. So the FFCRA was the first act. The second act that was passed by the government is the CARES Act, and they, these work together. So the FFCRA was meant to take care of employees affected by COVID because they couldn't work. And the CARES Act took it a step further and did a lot of things. They passed a lot of help for individuals when it comes to tax. Um, they changed unemployment, which affects this furlough situation here. If you're on a furlough and you get unemployment, you will also get an additional $600, which makes, again, the furlough a little less of a stinging smack. They're trying to help that. And then they brought in, as in the CARES Act, several SBA loans. One of those SBA products, just one, is called the Payroll Protection Plan, the Paycheck Protection Plan. And the PPP is all the rage, or has been for the last two weeks. And that plan is specifically designed to help employers bring employees back to work who have been furloughed or maybe were out on a sick leave and then they didn't come back because everything went to crazy, crazy time while they were out. So when you are on a furlough or you have several employees on a furlough, if you get a payroll protection loan, you are supposed to use the loan to pay payroll. So the thinking behind it was that you would bring your employees back to work and that you would unlay off people and that you would unfurlough people. And that is truly what some people are going to do. Some employers who have these loans are not going to bring them back right away because they need to wait until the action picks up again. There isn't a lot of reason to rehire your staff to just sit at home. It's best to wait until uh, a few weeks down the road when you have that PPP loan, but they're definitely related. So when people say to me, well, uh, I don't have a PPP, what else can I do? The next step is employer, there's two things here. There's an employee retention credit that's become very interesting. And there's also the employer payroll tax deferral. Both of these relate to the FFCRA because if you pay someone for a leave and the government pays you 100% back, you cannot also ask for your payroll protection to reimburse you. That's double dipping. There are so many programs going on right now that a lot of them have sort of punitive language around double dipping opportunities. So if you furloughed people and they're on unemployment and then you bring them back and you use your PPP for them, you will have to show that you didn't also ask for forgiveness because you paid someone for a leave or anything at all. The employer retention credit is for employers that have any number of employees. So when the FFCRA doesn't apply, because the FFCRA applies to less than 500, people call and they say, what can I do? The two things they can do are the employer retention credit or the employer payroll tax deferral. The payroll tax deferral is not listed on this slide, but suffice it to say, you can't defer your payroll taxes if you never paid them. So you can't defer payroll taxes on FFCRA leaves. You can't defer payroll taxes if you do the retention credit. But the payroll tax deferral is out there. So if you are uh, payroll professionals listening to this call, you can call me and talk to me about it. It's something you can do if you're not doing other things. You can defer 6.2%, the employer portion. It's not that you never pay it. You have to pay it over the next two years. Then the next step is another credit. The employer retention credit is a little bit like the FFCRA in that if your business is just in terrible shape, meaning that your receipts, your revenues have dropped over 50%, or 
if you're subject to a shutdown, there's a credit that goes against your employer taxes on your 941. And the credit can be as much as $5,000 per person per quarter on your payroll. So if you have less than 100 employees, so pretend you're a restaurant. This is really aimed at people who are really suffering. Restaurants, hotels. If you're a restaurant and you have less than 100 employees and you've been shut down because of a government order, but you kept paying your employees after March 15th, it actually goes into effect March 12th, you can apply for a $5,000 credit per head up to that, as long as they, it's, a, it's half of their wages up to 5,000, there are always limitations. But if they made $10,000 over the course of the quarter, which is only $40,000 a year, so it's possible, you can get a $5,000 credit for each one of those people that you as a magnanimous employer left on payroll, even though they were not able to do their job. So this credit is very particularly for people who kept paying payroll, even though their employees just had nowhere to go to work, couldn't service the clients, just had absolutely no reason to go and do their job because it was impossible. So say that you had people who were working part-time. It's also eligible to those, of, those employers who suffered a 50% drop in receipts. What's, also, a little bit interesting about this is if you have less than 100 employees, you get $5,000 per head for everybody, whether they were working or not. If you have more than 100 employees, the, and all the way up to the top, really, if you have more than 100, this credit is available to you for the workers that you paid who were unable to work. So again, it's all about helping you if you kept people on payroll because you just didn't know what to do. And this has been very effective for first quarter people. The last two payrolls of March, lots of employers out there didn't lay anybody off, didn't furlough anybody right away because they didn't know what was gonna happen. And yet they really sunk. And the first quarter results are coming out this week for most of these companies and they look horrendous. And so they're calling and saying, is there any immediate relief? The answer is yes. You take those $5,000 per head amounts and you fill out a form. It's a brand new tax form and you send it into the government and they apply those credits against your second quarter payroll or whatever is your next payroll. And it is a tremendous and instantly helpful way to put cash in your pocket. So to summarize that, we talked about the FFCRA, which then led to the CARES Act. And in the CARES Act, there are provisions of, of relief that absolutely dovetail with the FFCRA leaves, and they mention the FFCRA leaves over and over because they don't want double dipping. The CARES relief is very popular right now, and that is the SBA loans, one of which is the PPP, also the employer tax deferral, which means you just shove it down the road, just kick that can down the road, or the employer retention credit. So there's quite a lot of relief in these packages. The government is hustling to provide some relief to taxpayers, especially around employment, especially around keeping people on payroll, especially around helping people who can't work. Keep all of that in mind. It's quite confusing. Um, and even people like me who read it all day, every day, have to keep rereading it. So if we have blown your mind, it's okay. All right, next slide. Okay. So this is talking about some additional information about furloughs <clears throat> and how they impact your employees. So this is, this is written about employees from an employer perspective. So take this as something that you as the employer need to know as you, you know, if you do take these actions about the employment at your company. So if you, if you furlough someone, we mentioned you're not terminating their employment. So the question has come up, if in states that do require an immediate payout or do require payout for PTO or vacation hours, do you need to do that if they're furloughed or can they hang on to their balances and have them when they get back? 
The answer is you should pay them out when they're terminated, or I'm sorry, when they go on furlough, excuse me. Uh, because if, you, if they don't come back from furlough, they could very easily make the argument, I was terminated two months ago. I'm just notified now that you know my job has gone away, but I haven't worked for two months. So I really should have been paid out whatever PTO or earned vacation wages that I had that were unused that should have come to me, that money should have come to me then. So now it's two months late in getting to me and that's a problem and it becomes a wage and hour issue. So to avoid that, we recommend pay out the PTO when you do the furlough. Um, Jen, do you have any additional comment on that? I do. It's the squeaky wheels that'll really get you on this one, folks. So say that someone gets furloughed and they're mad and they go get another job and you didn't pay out their balance and they notify you that they're not coming back. They have a wage and hour claim and that's just how the ball rolls. So a wage and hour claim is basically a penalty for not paying people on time. That's really all it is. It is not covered by employer's liability insurance. And it's really expensive because if the government of most states determines that you failed to pay someone everything they were due on their last day of employment with you, they are basically assumed to have not been terminated which means that you didn't let go of them properly and they're still on your payroll for at most 30 days, but you could owe them for 30 days of additional pay. It's extremely expensive. So if you furlough 10 people and you mess up and you don't pay them, and then two months later they're angry at you and they all say that they were incorrectly terminated and that it wasn't a furlough, that it was a termination, then all of a sudden you owe them all their PTO and another 30 days of pay. So it's obviously a drag to pay this out when everybody's hurting, but it's for sure a big savings in the long run in case anything goes wrong. Right, and if you're in a state that has different regulations on whether you have to pay out PTO or not, fall back on the policies and the precedent that you have at your company. The same HR rules apply that if you have set rules for your company, if you have a policy that you always pay it out, don't treat people differently now that they're going on furlough and don't treat different groups of employees different than other groups of employees. Be consistent and stick to your policy and reference your state regulations to make sure you're in compliance with that because those rules are still very much in effect despite any of this new legislation. The next question on here is about giving furlough notices. Yes, you should give written notice of a furlough. Um, I will say that um, the notice period for the WARN Act, if you're a large employer in California, that has been suspended temporarily because of the COVID crisis. However, it still states that you should give enough notice to your employees that you know, a reasonable notice, et cetera. There's no hard bright line here, but be very careful about that and do provide notice to your employees ahead of time and do give them something in writing that is a furlough letter, as we talked about, that estimates their return date, uh, that tells them what's going on so that they and you have some documentation. Now wait, if, I'm, hold on, because I'm an accounting girl. The warn notice, help me. That is a basically a warning and a heads up that says you're going to be furloughed on a future date. And in my experience, usually it's a really long time. And when you say it's suspended, you mean that you're not required to give a super long notice anymore. Right, correct? so typically, typically employees, now there's federal warn and there are state warns. Not all of them have been suspended. Um, so keep that in mind. If you are, if you are, laying off or furloughing a large portion of staff at one time, say 50 employees or more is one of the thresholds. Um, you need to give in some cases up to 60 days notice before you can even take that action. Uh, in California, for instance, the governor has come out and said that's suspended for now. We're not going to require that. However, we are gonna require that you give reasonable notice or notice as soon as you can. I would say be very careful if you're not, you know, if you're in other states, go look and see one if your state has its own WARN Act and if it is in a state of suspension or if it's still active. 
check the Federal Warrant Act as well. Uh, so be aware of that when you talk about the length of notice you're giving to your employees. Um, it's not something that you would want to be non-compliant in and find out after the fact. So if you're considering furloughs or layoffs um, and you're thinking about the amount of notice or the type of documentation you give them, the answer is be cognizant of these WARN acts that are legislation that already exists and how they may affect you in the state that you're in. Uh, be cognizant of the Federal WARN Act and how it affects you or the state that it's in and what level of um, activation it's in at the time you take your action um, because you'll want to do that homework ahead of time. Right, but these days I will tell you that practically speaking most people are not giving much notice because everything you know, went to hell in a handbasket overnight. That's right. Um, so we're trying to be polite. We're all, at, so in that case, it sounds like what you were describing as the furlough notice is the polite thing to do, which will relieve some anxiety around the furlough and say, look, you're gone for now. We wanna bring you back as soon as we can. I think that provides comfort to the employees who are on furlough. Um, Shannon, this last one is a big one. On furloughs and exempt and non-exempt employees. It's huge. Yep. Go for it. Yep. So uh, furloughs do affect exempt and non-exempt employees differently. Think about the difference between a non-exempt employee and an exempt employee and how they're paid. Non-exempt employees are paid hourly. I understand some might receive what's called a non-exempt salary, but basically it's just an estimation of their hourly rate times their schedule for a pay period. If they work overtime, they can still put in for that overtime. So non-exempt employees are essentially paid by the hour and exempt employees are paid for their body of work. So if you look at what an exempt employee is expected to complete in a week's worth of work, then you know, that's their work that they have to do. And if they have to work an extra hour to finish their work, if they have to work an extra day on the weekend, that's how they get their salary and they are not eligible to turn in for overtime. And of course, the qualifications for being non-exempt or exempt, it is, it, you know, it's a different conversation about how you classify your employees. But once those are established, if an exempt person works any time during the week, they're eligible to get their salary for that whole week um, because they are completing their body of work. And if you have an employee who is non-exempt, who works one day a week, they get paid for the hours that they worked in that day. They do not necessarily get their entire weekly paycheck unless they have paid time off hours or something like that to fill it in with. So if you're furloughing someone, um, you need to be cautious of that because sometimes people will say, well, we'll just reduce someone's hours and we'll cut back. So we're gonna say they're only gonna work, um, you know, this one day a week and then, but they'll stay exempt, we'll just pay them for their one day. You really can't do that. If they're working at all during the week, they're supposed to get their whole salary. The other thing to consider is if they are cut back in salary to below the exempt salary threshold, they're getting into being a non-exempt employee and that has other ramifications for overtime and time tracking and meal breaks and things like that. All right, so the bottom line is, if you furlough someone who's hourly, you can have them come back hourly, and it will coordinate with their unemployment benefits, probably. That's a whole nother discussion. If they are exempt and you call them back for a, a one day, you have to pay them for the entire week. So the rule of thumb that we've given everybody is, if you furlough a salaried person, don't have them work, even if they offer, and they say, I'd like to help out, call me anytime. Best practice is don't do it, don't, don't succumb to the temptation. If they're an hourly worker, you can bring them back a little bit, okay? Okay, um, okay ladies, what about, I think we're getting up to, we're about six minutes left, and I think maybe we can confirm a couple things that we heard throughout um, your excellent presentation. I think the first one is around dates of when does all of this take effect? I mean, it feels like things are happening so fast. Can you confirm the dates around all of this new, new laws? FFCRA goes into effect on April 1st. So even though it was published and 
was everybody was seeing it before April 1st. It's effective for any employer of less than 500 people. It's mandatory as of April 1st. Okay, great. What about contractors? Are contractors um, part of this or not? No, no, okay. no, and no. Um, do, do they qualify for the FFCRA leave? Do people qualify for the FFCRA leave if they are furloughed or laid off? No, nope, yep, it's a bummer. They can, they can go get unemployment, but they're not, if they're furloughed or laid off, they're not eligible for these, um, these like um, paid leaves of absence. Okay, and I know you guys put a lot of numbers up there, but, and there's probably no specific answer, but in generalities, you know, how much is reimbursable by the government? 100%. 100% of the leaves that are paid under the FFCRA are reimbursed. You just have to observe the maximums that are published and you have to do the math. And as long as you pay what is prescribed by the FFCRA, you will be 100% reimbursed. You will not be out of pocket one penny and you won't be out of pocket the employee's health insurance either. Okay, okay. Well, with regards to headcount, what, um, any, any uh, clarity you can provide with regards to definitions about how head count is counted? The number of heads is 500 or less, but it includes full and part-time. And that is because they were looking at places like um, stores where they have a lot of part-timers and full-timers, and they wanted to make sure that they were all eligible for these paid leaves based on the amount that they normally make in a week. So full and part-timers are included in the headcount. Okay. Um, what about the, you know, you guys had some conversation around the COVID sick leave. And one of the things that jumped out was with regards to, you have to docu document, um, you know, why you feel like someone is um, qualifies for the COVID sick leave, but some of that documentation was in direct violation of HIPAA rules. Was, was, did I yeah. hear that right? Yes. You, you sure did. You can't okay. ask about symptoms or specifics of health. And Shannon told everybody to get a doctor's note and document the school that was closed. So it's very arm's length. Right. It's very arm's length. And, you know, be careful in asking for a doctor's note as well. Um, because there is some legislation around that also being, you know, protected information about an employee. Um, so I would say be sure to document the medical provider. And if there is certification that they, you know, are being treated for COVID-19 symptoms, etc., they can do that. If they're on the leave because they're being treated for COVID-19 symptoms, and then it comes back that they were tested and they don't have COVID-19, they just have the flu or, or something else, the benefit should stop at that point because you've proven that it's not eligible. So you can start and then stop once you find out the real situation. Okay, awesome, awesome. And I think the last uh, question that we have is just a, a lot around the how. How should people be tracking things? How do people get money to the bank? How do people get paid? How do they process payroll? Any insight into just the mechanics of all of this? Yep, and our, our payroll team works with our HR team, works with accounting teams. We can help with that. It's really, it starts with the timesheet, then it goes to the payroll system, tracking time correctly, and then it goes to the Form 941, which is the quarterly payroll tax return, and that's where everything comes to fruition and gets reconciled and paid back at the very latest. Okay, well, thank you so much, ladies. This has been very, very helpful. So much legislation. I would say um, there is a lot on our Rapid Response Team website. If anyone has questions, please go to there. We are helping um, lots of organizations in lots of different ways, whether it be there cash controls, um, finding government aid, uh, like today's topic, HR and remote workforce, uh, communications, and definitely boiling that down by industry as well. Thank you so much for everybody for joining. Um, this will be recorded and shared out to everyone as well. 
And um, if anyone still has questions about the PPP, I know that one is even more of a burning platform than HR questions, uh, please join our webinar Q&A on Thursday. Thank you so much.